Anchor Church, what does it look like to go from a planted church to a rooted church? How can our church plant outlive us? See, when the storms of life come, the difference between a planted tree and a rooted tree becomes very obvious. One blows away in the wind, and the other can withstand life's fiercest storms because the root system is secured. Our lives need to have our root system anchored in Christ, rooted in His Word. Come and join us as we explore and submit to what God's Word has to say to each of us about what it looks like to be rooted. If you've got your Bibles, grab them. We're going to be in the Gospel of Luke this morning. Luke chapter 10. Preaching on this idea of uh, religion versus gospel. And I, I don't know what comes to mind when you think of the two, but they are, there's a juxtaposition. They, they're, they're opposed to one another to a certain degree. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to wrestle with you this idea of religion versus gospel. Uh, I don't know if you ever talked to people and, and maybe you're trying to share your faith a little bit and they're like, you know, I, I'm just not religious. I'm just not religious. Anybody else ever heard that? Yeah, so I'm not either. So that's how I respond. I'm not either. They're actually religious people killed my savior. And so I'm actually not religious. So we can just disarm that one right away. But see, uh, just a very simple definition. Religion is man's pursuit of God. Tracking? So religion is, is me chasing him, me chasing him. Well, the gospel is him chasing me. The gospel is Jesus is now chasing us. Do you see how different these two terms are, these two understandings. And, you know, I'll be honest, religion's a lot easier. It really is. There's this series of checkboxes that you just kind of, you go through the motions. It's like, okay, I went to church, check. I put a little money in the box on the back wall, check. I didn't cuss out the barista because I was in a bad mood, check. I paid my off, my whatever, check, check, check. This is what we do. Oh, I'll see you in heaven. See, it doesn't work that way. That's us pursuing things that are good, but the good pursued us. And there's a massive, massive difference. And so what we, what we need to do, though, is we've got to understand that because Jesus Christ loves you, that he's coming after you, right? And so he's, he's actually on his way into your heart as we speak. And th- there's a problem, though. We miss the beauty of him chasing us. We miss the beauty of the gospel. And it's mainly because we're so busy, I, I, and it's not just me. It's, I know I'm type A, and I, and I operate out of 168 hours in the week, 1,440 minutes in the day. I know. But I know a lot of you as well are far too busy, and we miss the beauty of the gospel. We miss the beauty of what Christ is doing because we're, we're so busy. And, and I think that if we're real honest with each other, we come by it naturally. This is part of our fallen state. Uh, I think of myself growing up. Uh, long line of workaholics. I, I come from a long line of proud workaholics where my dad owned three dairy farms growing up. My mom owned a ladies' dress shop. There was never downtime. We were always go, go, go. So much so that I remember as a kid, we'd come home from school, we'd go out in the barn, we'd do our chores, go milk the cows. We'd come in, and <laughs> my brother and I, all we wanted to do was sit and watch Fresh Prince of Bel Air. That's really all we wanted to do, right? And so as soon as that TV went on, here comes my mom with a basket full of whites, <laughs> drops them. We couldn't watch TV unless we folded whites. To this day, I hate folding whites. <laughs> you know what it taught me, though? I can't just sit. It taught me that I can't just be. I've always got to produce. I've always got to perform. Well, you know what Jesus says? Y'all don't got to perform. He says, I did. I performed on the cross. So we just got to change our mindset because our society, especially in the American culture, we place so much value on what we produce. When you say to somebody, you know, how are you doing? I'm busy. Didn't ask if you're busy. I asked how you were doing. And then they go on to tell you about how much work they produce, how many things they perform in, and their, their, their record of all of their achievements. And you're like, I was just asking how you were doing. You know, but we place so much emphasis on really the wrong things. I would, I would say that it's safe for all of us to say that we're easily distracted because we're so busy. So what I want to do this morning is I want to wrestle with a very simple question. What is really important in life? Is it different for all of us? Should it be different from all of us? Let's, rest, let's look at the word of God. And let's ask Jesus, hey, what is is really important in life? And so I'll be in Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 38. 
Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary who, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and, and she went up to Jesus. She went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. And so, Jesus, I just ask humbly that you would help this to make sense. These are not just words on a page. These are your very words about what you accomplished on earth. And I know, Jesus, that you're trying to teach each and every one of us this morning something. And so I pray that you would open our spiritual eyes and spiritual ears by your Holy Spirit to help it make sense. Because on my own, I just don't get it. But with you, I think there's a better chance of getting it. And so I ask that you would meet us in this moment, that you would be here, and you would be glorified, Jesus. In your name we all pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's just dive right in. Now, as they went on their way... Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. Set the stage real quick. Jesus is hanging out with his guys. They're doing all kinds of stuff, and they're traveling outside of Jerusalem. So that they end up in this town. Just It's this little town called Bethany. It's about two miles outside of, it's about two miles outside of, uh, of Jerusalem, nestled in between the Judean mountains. And you get a real good idea if I could click my thing right. What am I doing wrong, Joshua? It's not working. Please hold. Well, hmm. Progress, not perfection, right? Okay, so here we are. Bethany, now you can see what I see. It's this little village, and, and there's a, some people that live there. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Jesus was crazy about them. So he ends up outside of Jerusalem, outside of kind of where he's been working, and, and it says that Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. Well, we know a lot about Martha so far since we, we've already read the story that she's a worker, she's all these things. But you know what? She was dear to Jesus. So was Mary, right? I look at John eleven five. 5. The Gospel of John records it this way. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. This was a very special love that he had for this family. So he's probably excited to go to his friend's house, right? He's been working. You know how that is. You've been working so hard. You got something to look forward to. You get to go to your friend's house. And that's, that's where he finds himself with all of his disciples. And Martha is just like the ultimate hostess. Like as soon as Jesus is near, she's like, come in my house. Come on in. You guys know these kind of people, right? They just can't help but serve. They can't help but open their houses. I mean, like for example, if I'm at a dinner at somebody's house, anybody's house, and my sister Mel is there, if there is a dish to be picked up, poof, she's on it. Like you can't, you're, you're, that last bite isn't even in you. She's got your plate. She wants to serve. Or even around here, if there's a broom, Scott or Ellen are going to wrestle, wrestle over it to go clean something up. These guys just, they, people love to serve. We need these people. They make everything go around. They make things work. And they're great. They're great to have on our team. They should, we should all love serving. It's not a bad thing to serve. I know Martha loved Jesus very much. And so serving him for her was an honor. So she's happy to have him and her uh, and the disciples, excuse me, in their home. And so that's how she serves, right? She gets to work. She gets in the house and she does all that. Well, there's another way to serve. And so she has this little sister called Mary, right? Mary is sitting at the Lord's feet, listening to his teaching. Mary was serving Jesus in a different way. You do understand that worship is serving. Serving is worship, so Mary is also serving Jesus. But I got to unpack this. This is, is such a profound verse for us to understand. Uh, back in the day, it was a normal posture. If there was a rabbi, a teacher, people would sit at the feet of the teacher. It was, this was a normal setting. But you know who was never sitting at the feet of a rabbi? A woman. Never in the original, in first century, no woman sat at the feet of rabbis. I mean, Judaism didn't forbid women from learning the Torah. They were fine with it, but you would have never seen a rabbi allowing a woman to sit at his feet for a number of reasons, but we'll just, just understand that this was Jesus being revolutionary. Jesus being viewed by all the elders, all the scribes, all the Pharisees as a heretic for allowing a woman 
to be near his feet. So Jesus is now in his friend's house, and his friend is sitting at his feet learning. And, and Jesus, clearly the wisest man ever, knew what he was doing. He was setting the stage for how important women are to him. He's setting the stage for us today, how, women, how important women are to us. A high value of women. And so who's this Mary? Okay, so you know, there's six different Marys in the Bible. This is Mary of Bethany. We hear about Mary of Bethany three times in the New Testament. Three times in the Gospels, okay? First time, right here, right? Uh, she's sitting at the feet of Jesus, learning and listening. Sitting at the feet of Jesus. Uh, the second, another time is John chapter 11 in 28 through 37. And there is when she ran to Jesus. Her heart was broken that her brother had died. So she runs to Jesus and where's she at? She falls to his feet yet again. The third time that we see this is when she's preparing Jesus to be buried. John chapter 12, she's kneeling at the feet of Jesus, anointing his feet. When people say, hey, where's so-and-so? Are you sitting at the feet of Jesus? Because when I read about this woman, she's got some wildly good priorities. Things are good, she's at the feet of Jesus. Things are bad, she's at the feet of Jesus. Where do you go? We know where she went. Nowadays, instead of saying we're sitting at the feet of Jesus, we call it quiet time. That's okay. We can call it that. We call it devotions, right? But, but the idea is you just need to get this idea of a posture that we're sitting at the feet of Jesus. Would that change how you read your Bible? If you felt like he was literally reading it with you and with you in that moment. In order for us to be truly rooted in Christ, we have to be sitting at his feet. It starts with us sitting, and then it moves to us listening, and then it li li moves to us applying. And so it really is that she's, Mary's helping us answer what is really important in life, and it's to intentionally spend time with Jesus. And I will tell you every day, not because you have to, that's religion. Religion says you need to read your Bible every day. Religion says that you need to pray three times a day. Religion says, religion says, religion says, gospel says, I want to meet with you. Jesus says, I want you to spend time with me because I want to spend time with you. That's not a checkbox. That's a heart that has moved towards Christ and wants to be with him. So we got to do this on purpose. This is us worshiping. This is us serving when we're intentionally spending time with Jesus. Mary got it. She clearly got it. Do we? Do we understand how important this is? And I, okay, this all sounds great, right? Like, oh my gosh, we should do that more. That is such a great idea. Not everybody thinks this is a great idea, including her sister. So Martha now, she's distracted with much serving. She went up to Jesus. She went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. Okay, now we all agreed in the beginning that we're easily distracted and we're too busy, right? So before we go and cast a stone at old Martha, we have to understand a few things. She loved Jesus and she just wanted to serve him. There is nothing wrong with that. And this term distracted is fascinating in the original language. It doesn't mean that she just posted something on Instagram and her, her, her phone's blowing up and she's distracted because of that. That's not what this means. It literally means that she's pulled away. When she's distracted, she's being dragged away is the, is the Greek word picture of what this word means. So it doesn't mean that she didn't care. It didn't mean that she didn't also want to sit at the feet of Jesus. It doesn't mean that at all. It just means that her priorities were more on the servitude. The priority for her was that everything else was lined up and perfect for Jesus. She was pulled away by apparent needs. You can almost sense the tension when you read this text. She's clearly a busy bee trying to get everything done. She wants the table set for Jesus. She wants the disciples to know how loved they are. She wants the house cleaned. But we get, some, we get some insight about how she handles this tension. It's one thing to have tension, and then it's another thing to see how it's lived out. So she goes up to Jesus and says, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? At first glance, I read this, and I was like, oh, no, you didn't. Like that, <laughs> Are you, you talk to Jesus like that. But I want you to remember how close they were. They spent a lot of time together so she could speak really frankly with Jesus. And I'm going to tell you right now, I think that he'd rather us talk to him like this than with our flowery, floofy prayers. 
I think he'd rather we were gut level honest and being like, hey, hey, you're not going to do anything. You're going to sit here and let my sister sit at your feet. I'm ticked off. I don't like this. I'm so glad that they put this in the Bible so that we can see how real and honest she is with Jesus. This is how real and honest Jesus wants us with him. This is how, how we're able to, to have that intimacy with Christ, that, that really relatable community with Jesus is because we know him and he knows us. But it's like this for all of us. The more time you spend with people, you understand their sense of humor. You understand what makes them tick. You understand all that. So she spends a lot of time with Jesus and, and she's pretty relaxed around him. She doesn't forget that he's Lord because she's referring to him that way, but they're, they're really close. And I, I think this is beautiful that we get to see that this is kind of what Jesus is after with our hearts. So she's irritated. I get it, right? You know, siblings. How many of you have siblings? Mm -hmm. They can bring out the best in us. And siblings can bring out the worst in us as well. It's just this built-in thing that God has done to our families. And so she's irritated with her sister. So she's irritated for two reasons. One, she ain't getting no help. She ain't getting no help. She's having to do all this on her own. Two, tradition. She was going against the customs of their day. You understand that she wasn't supposed to be sitting at the feet of Jesus. She was supposed to be serving the feet of Jesus. They were there to serve. Women in this culture were there to serve the rabbis, not sit with them. So you can almost like, when, you, when I read this, I'm almost like, I can just picture she's got her apron on. She's got all the, the pots and pans and she's cooking all the bread. And every time she walks by that living room, you can almost just see her like, right? Don't you just picture this? Like she just gives that little sister glare, like you gotta be kidding me. And then she hears them laughing. Everybody's having a good time. And she's sitting there working. Blood pressure's going up. She's upset at the situation. And then the famous Cindy Lauper explains to us that we see her true colors shining through. She was angry because she thought Mary was being selfish. She didn't realize that Mary was worshiping. She missed that she was worshiping. So she says this famous line, Lord, do you not care? I read that and I'm just like, ah, you know, my heart is aching for Martha. Her hair is probably a mess. She's running around trying to have everything perfect. She's probably saying things she's going to regret later. Oh, none of us have done this when we get excited or upset. We say things we shouldn't say. We do things we shouldn't do when we're ticked off and frustrated. I'm not the, am I the only one in this room? Okay, so Martha's human. man. So she's going through all these emotions, and then she has the audacity to say, Lord, do you not care? That's an honest, that's an honest prayer. That's an honest line. I have found myself saying it often. Hello, I'm here. I'm doing what I thought you wanted me to do. I, she thought he wanted her to serve. So she's doing exactly what she thought. And she's like, don't you care? Do you not care? I think many of us, if we are like Martha, which more of us are than we'd like to admit, we blame Jesus for our hardships. Yet it was her choice to do this. But see, it's easy to placate. It's easy to blame somebody else, including Jesus. If we don't like what's going on, if we don't like how things are turning out, if we don't like the way that things are going to happen, it's easy for us to do this. Do you like just blaming Jesus? I, I just picture almost like a kid like tattling on his sibling. You know, the problem is though, she's torn between duty and delight. So for her, her duty was to serve. She was one of the, the, the historian scholars believe that she owned this house. And so part of the hostess's responsibility, the owner was to provide for whoever was coming in that needed hospitality. So she's doing her duty. Her delight would have most likely been to be with Jesus. She loved him very much. So she's torn. Have you ever been torn between duty and delight where you know you got to do these things, but you'd rather be doing these things? So that's kind of what's, what I'm seeing here. And, and we know that Martha's the top shelf hospitality queen, and, but she's there to serve. She's there to serve. And, and I think that, I think that she had just turned her priorities just a bit. So if we look at what is really important in life, we've established that we got to serve God with daily devotion on purpose. We got to be chasing intentionally after being with Jesus every day. But the second part is we got to stay focused. Our priorities reflect our values. You, you can tell me all day that this and this and this and this is all important to you, but then I can just watch your life for about a day and I can see what your priorities really are. Is, is a five-star dinner more important to you than spending some time with your kids? Is a manicured lawn more important than sharing life with other people? 
See, our priorities are on display. And we can pretend all day long that, that we're selfless and we put ourselves all the way down on the list of priorities of life. But simple observation reveals what our priorities really are. Simple observation of Martha shows that, that her priority in this moment in time was simply to serve, not to be. And, and it's, it's not a bad thing because we got to serve, but there's a time and a place. And I, you know the old saying, uh, don't email me if you don't like this. The devil can keep you busy doing God's work. Busy, busy, busy serving. Where's the gospel in that? Where's the relationship in that moment? If all we're doing is doing, we miss the whole point. We are human beings, not human doings. And, and Martha is showing us that she's getting graded on her doing. That's how she feels, and she's just missing it because her priorities are reflecting that she'd rather serve than sit in this moment, even though it's good to do, but it's just out-of-line priorities. And that's not what Jesus wants. And Jesus makes that very clear. He says, the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious, and you are troubled with many things. Again, Jesus gives her a rebuke. He rebukes her. This is what this is, a mild rebuke. Okay, mind you, this is the kindness of Christ that leads us to repentance. That's what this is. He's not clobbering her over the head. He's like, hey, hey, Martha, you, 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 got, you got everything wound up. I, I need you to bring it down a little bit. Your anxiety is far too hard, high, and, and Jesus knows her heart. Jesus knows all the stuff she's got going on. Jesus knows your heart. Jesus knows all the stuff you got going on, which is why he says you're troubled about many things. She wasn't just worried about the meal. Martha's personality was such that, that everything kind of had to be in line and had to be perfect and had to be lined up. And, you know, the bummer is you just miss everything in the moment because you're so worried about all those other, all those other uh, secondary, tertiary, all the other things that don't really matter. Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled, not just about the meal. You missed our time together. You know, I, I was reading this. I was just meditating on this was a pattern for her. Right? This was something that was her normal go to. And one thing I know about Jesus is he breaks our bad patterns. Jesus is the one that meets us in that. He's in the business of fixing and restoring his people. Jesus is in the business of fixing us and restoring us. And that's what he wants to do for Martha. Martha's problem was not so much that she had all these things to do, but she allowed her work to distract her. And we are all guilty of this as well. We are all guilty of this as well. I, I look at this text, a simple translation is Martha, you know, next time let's order Domino's and we can just sit and hang out. I'd rather have a $7 pizza and spend time with you. It's more important to Jesus that we spend time with him than break out our good china. So he, Jesus brings all this together, and it's a beautiful way that he does it. He says, he's talking to Martha. Everybody else in the room is listening. You know that, right? And he says, one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Jesus paints a picture, perfect scene of religion versus gospel right here. Like we talked about, it's easier to just check things off the list. Right, It's easier to do religion because we know here, here's the bowling alley and the lanes are right here, so they're clearly marked. We stay within here. We check these boxes. We're good to go. Jesus is like, I'm going I'm to journey with you, and it's going to be an adventure. It's going to be crazy. It's going to be up, down, left, right, everywhere in between, but I'm right there with you. This is my gospel. I'm coming after you. I'm chasing after you. I love, I, I, Zephaniah 317, I was so moved by it this week. The Lord, your God, look at how God views you. The Lord, your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Do you picture God that way? Chasing after you, exulting over you with his singing. He just loves you. He wants to be with you, wants to spend time with you. Matthew 11 I can't say it's one of my favorite texts because that's, that's silliness, but this is up there for me. Come to me, come to me. Jesus says, come to me, all who labor, all who are heavy laden, and I will give you my rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. You got to be with me to know how to get the yoke off you. For I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Do you see that Jesus wants relationship? 
He doesn't need you checking boxes. He wants you sitting with him. Romans 5, 8, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We say it every week during communion, John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, that someone would lay down his life for his friends. He wants relationship. He gave up everything for relationship, not religion. He wants us to be with him. You know, and I think that as a church, I think we've done a bit of a disservice because every time I hear something about Mary Martha, it's either or. It's either you serve or you sit. You know, and I'm going to tell you right now, it's a both and. Because there ain't nothing wrong with serving. Are you kidding me? It's awesome. But our priorities have to be aligned with Christ. And that way, that way we move from an either or to a both and. Because guess what we're supposed to do? You're supposed to worship while you work. I look at the Apostle Paul. He says in Colossians 3, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men knowing that from the Lord you'll receive the inheritance as your reward because at your work you are serving Christ. And would you agree with me earlier that serving is worship and worship is serving? And so if you're not worshiping while you're working, you're doing it wrong. Because what we've done is we've, we've compartmentalized secular, 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 sacred, this whole little weird boxes as if we can really separate them. And by separating them, we're saying, well, when I go to work, you know, I'm just me. And I can just let whatever fly, and that's who I am, and that's how I'm going to be. But then we show up at church, and we're like, oh, sit here with our nice clothes on, this smiles, like everything's fine, and we haven't chased sin all week and acted like the devil. We don't compartmentalize our faith. There's no such thing as sacred, secular. There, we can't separate serving God from our work because we're serving him at work. So regardless of what we're doing, serving Jesus Christ is worshiping him. And there are times to work and worship, There are times to sit and worship. Both are worship. He says, Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken from her. So let me tell you this. Before the gospel is a call to work, it's a gospel to surrender. It's a gospel to surrender. It's a gospel to sit. It's a message, an invitation to just cease. And then we can answer this question, what is really important in life? Daily, right? Priorities align with our belief. And understand that being with Christ is greater than doing things for Christ. Being with him is better than working for him. He wants us, this is, this is first and foremost. He wants us to be with him. And then when we leave that moment, then we go work for him. But we're still with him because everything we do is service as unto Christ. If we view it that way, we no longer separate. We're no longer chameleon Christian. When we're with these people, we act this way. When we're with these people, we act this way. No, 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 no. We're consistent Christians. Our witness goes before us and it follows us. Every one of us here has a choice to make in our priorities. As much as I love a clean house, and I will be honest with you, I really do. I'd rather sit and spend time with my wife and my kids in my house than have a clean house and have nobody there. I think our priorities are out of alignment. Have you ever driven a car where, and maybe that's not as common today, but I remember back in like my first like three cars, the alignment always seemed to go out. So you're driving, you take your hand off the steering wheel, you know, you're, does anybody else ever have this? Okay, it's annoying, right? So then you go take it to Les Schwab or Zelsch Tire or whatever, and they realign your alignment, whatever that mechanical term is called, they fix it. So then you get back in your car, you let go of the steering wheel, and you're just right down the road. Well, when we're out of alignment, Everything doesn't work. You understand, one little thing out of alignment and it doesn't, we're going off the road. So what we've got to do is get aligned with Christ. Our alignment needs to, needs to know that being with Christ is so much greater than doing things for him. We do things for him later. My, my, one of my favorite books in the Bible, James, he says, faith without works is dead. Get to work. Obviously, if you don't take care of your family, you're worse off than an unbeliever. So you got to work. You got to produce. You got to provide. It's not just money. Finances, physical, emotional, spiritual, the whole kit and caboodle, okay? But what we've got to understand is, yeah, there's a time to work, but the most important thing is sitting at the feet of Jesus. She chose the good portion. She chose what was right. Mary has chosen it, and it will not be taken away from her. Translation, Mary, uh, Mary's not going to help you in the kitchen, okay? Okay? And oh yeah, and her salvation is going nowhere because she's chosen to sit here. 
I have lost none except for the one that was destined to destruction. She ain't going nowhere. She's not going to the kitchen, and she's going to be with me forever. She's chosen what was right, and she chooses to sit with me right now, which is what is right. The key to all this is us looking honestly at our own priorities. It's supposed to be Jesus Christ first, then others, then you. If we were honest, when it's not that way, things go crazy. Things get kooky. We hurt people. We get real selfish. We leave a wake of destruction when we put us too high. This isn't a show. You know, one of these Sundays, I wish we'd all come in like jammies with like no brush teeth and our hair is all nasty so we don't got to prove anything to anybody. Because it's not about looking good, smelling good. It's not, this is about us inside wanting Jesus more than anything. That would be a wild Sunday though, wouldn't it? That'd be really weird. That'd be really weird. Okay, so but the, the most, this is, what I'm try, this is what I'm trying to say. What matters most in the Christian journey is what God alone observes. This isn't a show. This isn't Sunday best. You're having a bad day. I want you to come in here and be like, I'm having a horrible day. Lord, why are you helping me? Why are you telling my sister to get back in here? I would rather that. I know Jesus would too. But we've played this game for so long that we got to have all of our stuff together. Well, I got news for you. What really matters is what he only sees. You know the old saying, character is who you are when no one is looking. No show, no pretending. Because I got news for you, not one of us in this room has all of our stuff together, except for Jesus. He's the only one that's here that has all of his stuff together. We're all just chasing him, trying to do our, just trying to chase holiness and, and get rid of the sin in our life. And he meets us in these moments. It's not what we display, it's not what we talk about. We can pretend to, to be Christians all day long, know when to say amen, know when to say, hey, good sermon, Pastor. Know when to throw an extra 20 in the plate. Hopefully somebody's looking. Get rid of all of it. Get rid of pretenses. Get rid of trying to produce. Get rid of trying to perform. I free you right now of having to perform. Jesus frees us right now of having to produce and to perform. And this is a word just as much for me. I've got to lay it all at the cross because I still feel like I've got to produce. That if I don't do this, this, and this, y'all are going to leave. You know what? Leave. I got to do as what I got to do is under Christ. I stand before him when I take my final breath and that's who I give my answer to. So I'm going to chase him with everything in me and I hope you do the same. Be freed of having to produce. I, I think Jesus is saying to us all today, you don't have to fold the whites for a while. You can come sit with me. You don't have to do anything. When's the last time you've done that? I know for myself, when I find my priorities getting jacked, getting out of balance, I jump in my truck or I jump on my motorcycle and I'll go out to Birch Bay. I'll go out to, you know, um, Silver Lake and I'll literally just have my Bible and my journal and I just go get lost for hours and I sit with Jesus and he realigns my priorities. I want you to want to just sit with him. Oh, I'm too busy. <laughs> we all got 168 hours in the week. You prioritize your schedule. We all have the same allotted time. Our priorities reveal what's important to us. And Jesus says, sit with me. Don't fold whites today. You can do that later. Religion is man's pursuit of God. The gospel is Jesus' pursuit of you. And unless we meet Jesus Christ personally and privately every day, we're going to end up like Martha, you guys. Busy. We're going to end up like Martha, busy. So we don't need to perform because being with Christ is greater than doing things for Christ. Being rooted in Christ means being in relationship with him so that when all of these things do happen, we go to him. I love Mary. I read that this week. I was blown away that every time something happened, she was recorded as being at the feet of Jesus. I want that for us. Hey, where's so-and-so? I haven't seen her. Oh, she's been, she's been praying all day. <laughs> Crazy, right? She's hanging out with Jesus. So we got to fight being distracted. We got we to fight for our daily quiet time. 
But it all has to be done on purpose. None of this just happens because you wake up and you're a good person. Do you know how many other things are pulling at us all day long? I don't care what season of life you're in, there's so many things pulling at us. Jesus needs to be first and most. So Jesus is the gospel. What he has done is the gospel. Him pursuing you is the gospel. And the simplest way that I can say this to answer what is the gospel is God created us and separated us and Jesus died to save us. He didn't die so you could work for him. Do you hear what I'm saying? He died so that you could be with him both now and forevermore. To be truly rooted in Christ, we need to fully understand what is most important in life. It's embracing, surrendering, and receiving the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everything else pales in comparison, and everything else will let you down. But he won't. So I challenge you this week, I challenge you today, go find some time to just sit and be. Go let his Holy Spirit speak to you. Go get lost in one of his psalms and just place yourself at the foot of the cross and be like, what does this mean, Jesus? Help me understand. I just want to be more with you. I want to be more like you. I want to share more life with you. No more games, no more performing, no more pretenses. He says, I'm coming after you. All I ask is that you would be with me. Amen. Jesus, I just want to thank you for this text that we have been able to sit under. God, I thank you for making the Bible real, making it come alive. I, God, I thank you that we get to see the life of Mary and Martha and this tension that's going on and, and what you did in the middle of it. You spoke truth. You spoke love. You spoke kindness. But you gave us what we needed today. God, you're freeing us from having to do, freeing us from having to perform God, I pray for the grace that would meet us in this moment. For some of us, it's a lot harder than others just to sit and be. And so I pray that when we do that, Father, that you would meet us there. You'd comfort us. You'd just show us your love and mercy. We desperately need you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.